Congressional Republicans are expected to unveil their latest COVID-19 relief bill tomorrow, the same week that emergency federal unemployment insurance is set to expire. The program has provided an estimated 25 million workers left jobless due to the COVID-19 pandemic with an extra $600 a week on top of their state's unemployment insurance. Today on Fox News Sunday, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin touted one GOP proposal, namely that unemployment benefits should pay out 70% of the recipient's previous salary, rather than a flat $600. We want to make sure with the expiring unemployment insurance, we have the technical fix so people don't get paid more to stay home than they do to work. And we can move very quickly with the Democrats on these issues. We've moved quickly before. And I see no reason why we can't move quickly again. At a news conference today in New York, Democratic Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer threw cold water on that proposal, saying that the current unemployment program should be extended. We should not give a 30% pay cut to those who lost their jobs through no fault of their own. This, the unemployment insurance has kept millions out of poverty, prevented the recession from becoming a depression. We need to extend it. For the fifth day in a row, more than 1,000 people in the United States died from COVID-19. Confirmed cases of coronavirus now total more than 4.1 million nationwide and more than 146,000 deaths, according to the New York Times. Florida today passed New York to become the state with the second highest total of confirmed infections. Florida has averaged more than 10,000 new cases a day for nearly two weeks. Hotspots where new cases are rising the fastest continue to be in states that reopened first. Globally, new COVID-19 cases are growing at an average rate of more than 250,000 every day, according to researchers at Johns Hopkins. The United States, Brazil, and India continue to have the most COVID-19 cases, with confirmed infections continuing to rise in all three countries. Hurricane Hannah made landfall in southern Texas and headed toward Mexico today, the first hurricane of the 2020 Atlantic season. The storm hit as a Category 1 hurricane about 130 miles south of Corpus Christi late yesterday afternoon. It was downgraded to a tropical storm early this morning, but continued to batter the South Texas coast with 60 mile per hour winds. And in Hawaii this morning, residents were preparing for the onslaught of Hurricane Douglas. The storm is expected to bring from 5 to 15 inches of rain and is packing damaging winds. Shelters with social distancing requirements are open on several of the islands, and Hawaiian Airlines canceled all flights between Hawaii and the U.S. mainland as a precaution. The body of civil rights leader John Lewis made a symbolic journey over the same bridge that brought national attention to the fight for civil rights 55 years ago. In a somber and moving ceremony, Lewis's casket was carried from the Brown Chapel Andy Church to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, the site of what became known as Bloody Sunday. Today, Lewis and others were beaten and attacked as they marched for voting rights in 1965. Today, as the casket crossed the bridge, it was saluted by Alabama state troopers. It was Alabama police who brutally beat Lewis on March 7, 1965. At the top of the bridge, there was a moment of silence. At the base of the bridge, the carriage crossed over roses members of the Lewis family placed to mark the exact spot where Lewis spilled his blood. Today's procession was part of a week of ceremonies honoring the life of John Lewis. Tomorrow, he will lie in state in the U.S. Capitol. Lewis died from pancreatic cancer at the age of 80 on July 17th. The map has really shifted uh, in, in the battleground states we thought were battleground. With 100 days left before the election, Jeff Greenfield weighs in. Visit pbs.org slash news app for more. The COVID-19 pandemic has upended the planned national conventions of both political parties, forcing the cancellation of the large in-person gathering that we've become accustomed to seeing. The first of those, the Democratic National Convention, was to be held in Wisconsin this month. We visited there last year with the hope of returning for the convention. Instead, we recently spoke with Ben Winkler, chairman of the Democratic Party of Wisconsin, to see what their plans are for rallying constituents in the lead up to the election. Ben. We caught up with you about a year ago. The plans were to have a big old DNC convention in Wisconsin, get everybody excited about the convention being there, and perhaps help flip the state blue. Now, virtual convention, good, bad, and different for all that enthusiasm you wanted to get going? You know, 
the number one priority for Democrats when it comes to the convention is to make sure that people are safe. And frankly, the Democratic message in this election and in general is that we actually care about people and what happens to them. It's why we fight so hard to make people, sure that people have health care. It's why we want to fight and organize and build to stop the coronavirus pandemic so we can safely send kids back to school and reopen the economy and not watch the death toll climb day after day. So all of that is of a piece with having a virtual convention that doesn't put people's lives at risk. So what happens to the old fashioned door knocking? Do people not do that anymore? Is it all phone calls? We don't want to create a situation where you literally can't alert people to your presence without getting within six feet of where they'll be when they open the door. So we've switched to a totally virtual organizing style. We, in, in the spring Supreme Court election in Wisconsin, you probably saw the photos of people lining up in their masks. We were organizing 100% virtually with phone calls, text messages, social media, asking people to contact people that they have personal relationships with. We reached out to people millions of times and helped more than a million people across the state cast absentee ballots. What happens in November? Are there going to be the same number of polling locations open? Because I know in lots of states, the volunteers, who are often senior citizens, have said, you know, I don't want to take the risk right now. So are you concerned about longer on the poll than what we already saw? This spring in Wisconsin, huge numbers of polling places disappeared because of the lack of polling place volunteers uh, and poll workers. And because of that, there were long lines in, in several parts of the state, Milwaukee, Waukesha, Green Bay. As we go into this fall, cities, municipal clerks, county clerks have been working overtime to figure out ways to make in-person voting safe and to encourage people to cast absentee ballots. The yeah, other thing I want to ask is the Black Lives Matter movement. How has that impacted enthusiasm or drive uh, in the process? The, the mobilization in defense of black lives in Wisconsin as across the country has been tremendous, has been inspiring, and has been so widespread that it's blown to smithereens stereotypes about who actually cares about the fight against racism in our country. There were Black Lives Matter protests in at least 46 different communities in Wisconsin, in, in large cities like Milwaukee and Madison, and in small towns, sometimes with just a few thousand people. There are so many people, when we talk to them right now, who say that they see their vote this November as an extension of their activism, the same activism that brought them to the streets this spring. Look, I mean, this is still a state that has deep red pockets, and this is a state that very infamously had high school students throwing swastika signs. I mean, there's still pockets of the state that will not congeal around a Black Lives Matter movement or uh, an alternative vision. Wisconsin is scarred by some of the deepest uh, racial disparities in the country. In the 2010 census, Wisconsin had the highest rate of incarceration of black men of any state in the United States. And weaponizing racism has been a go-to tactic, both for Republicans in Wisconsin and for the Trump administration. So we, we know that they'll try to use the playbook they used in 2016, and it didn't work then, and it's not gonna work this year either, because people in our state, uh, across race, uh, whatever beliefs they hold about people of, of other races, they are experiencing the pain caused by a presidency that doesn't care about them at all, day to day in their lives. People are losing loved ones and friends to coronavirus. They're losing their jobs. They're seeing promise after promise that this administration makes a break in the instant that they, that they make the promise. Uh, dairy farms are going out of business at a rate of two or three a day across our state. Uh, and those, those farms are very hard to get back once they're gone. This is the state that's just experiencing the pain of the Trump administration. We're in a state where the Republicans are, what, three or so seats away from a veto-proof majority. Can they get there? Republicans are trying everything in their power to get to super majorities in our state legislature. If they get the super majorities, they'll gerrymander the state again for another 10 years. And we're doing everything in our power to stop them. I think that we're going to win that 